Hi everyone, and welcome to this ACM SIGSOFT webinar that's going to be examining the intersection of deep learning and software engineering research. I'm really excited to be here today to talk about the intersection of these two very exciting fields. Now, I think that this is a really opportune time to be talking about research at the intersection of deep learning and software engineering. And this is particularly due to some of the new tools that are being released to the public that are basically implementing large scale deep learning models to help automate various types of programming tasks. And probably one of the more uh, popular techniques that has been released recently is the GitHub Copilot tool, which is now in a technical preview. So in order to organize this talk, I'm going to be talking about three main topics. First, I want to talk a little bit about background, the evolution from machine learning to deep learning. I think this is a really important starting point to understand you know, where the field has been and start to examine some of the future directions and paths forward in the later part of the talk. Next, I want to talk about a specific research area known as deep learning for software engineering, where researchers have been working to uh, leverage deep learning techniques in order to enhance and automate a range of software engineering tasks. And I'm going to survey some of the current state of research in this particular field. Then finally, to conclude, I want to look forward and examine some of the different future directions and paths forward for work at the intersection of deep learning and software engineering. So let's get into it, starting with the evolution of machine learning to deep learning. So first I'd like to start with, you know, what really is machine learning? And essentially it is a branch of artificial intelligence that allows computers to infer patterns from data, which can then be used for the prediction of new data points. And I also think it's important to situate both machine learning and deep learning within the overall hierarchy of artificial intelligence. So at the kind of top level here, we have the field of artificial intelligence as a whole. Then we have machine learning that exists within this field. Then we have a subfield of this called representational learning that's concerned with learning different types of representations of data. And then finally, at the very end, we have deep learning. So as you can see, there's been a lot of work that has been done on machine learning and representational learning more broadly, and that deep learning is really just a subset of these various different fields uh, under artificial intelligence. I think it's also important to understand the different types of traditional machine learning techniques uh, that have been used. So I want to go over a brief taxonomy here. So first we have supervised learning. This is probably the type of machine learning that most people are the most familiar with. Here we have you know, some uh, continuous or categorical target variables, uh, which have some form of labels that we can either use for forms of regression or classification, leading to things like price prediction or medical imaging. There's also uh, something called unsupervised learning. And this is when there's really no target variable available or no labeled data available. And here, rather than trying to uh, make predictions about you know, the particular, certain you know, particular labeled properties of data, instead, these learning algorithms tend to try to cluster the data into semantically meaningful clusters or work on associations uh, that are going to be meaningful to the particular data set. Next, we have something called semi-supervised learning, where there may be a target variable available, and we can essentially try to you know, have a partially supervised technique that is able to you know, work towards classification and clustering. And some common applications of this might be text classification or lane finding using GPS data. Finally, in kind of its own category, we have reinforcement learning. And here we might have a categorical target variable or we might not have a target variable available at all. And you know, this could lead to things like classification or control algorithms uh, for things like optimized marketing or driverless cars. So within these different types of machine learning techniques, there are a number of different, what I'm going to call canonical representations. These are kind of traditional machine learning techniques that have been used uh, you know, for decades of research at this point. Things like naive Bayes, decision trees, uh, support vector machines, hidden Markov models, uh, 
association rule learning. There's a lot of these techniques that researchers and practitioners have been using for a long time now. So it's also important to understand the differences between machine learning and traditional programming. So with traditional programming, you are essentially uh, writing a program to process some data and to produce some form of output. But with machine learning, this paradigm is a little bit different. Instead, you are taking uh, data and the expected output, and you're expecting the machine to essentially learn or infer this program. And this is the essence of machine learning. This is essentially what we are trying to do when we apply machine learning to a given problem. Typically, the problem is very difficult to pin down analytically in code, and it's easier to have the machine actually learn the program for that problem through observing a large set of data. So when can machine learning actually be applied? Well, there's three main conditions. First, you have to have some sort of existing data set. Second, there has to be some sort of pattern that exists in the data or that you think exists in the data that will be useful for some task. And then third, that pattern is likely not going to be very well defined or very easily captured uh, because if it were, then you could just write an analytical program to do that. So these are the three main conditions. And then the computational learning process proceeds as follows. So we have some target unknown target function that we're trying to approximate. And essentially we try to make more and more approximations of that target function until we feel like the machine has done a good enough job and we can use it for our purposes. So this is the essence of the learning process. So one very common task, uh, just to illustrate this, is you know, supervised machine learning applied to image classification. In this task, we have a set of data, maybe it's pictures of animals like we have here between birds and bears. And we have some model that's going to essentially try to embed these images in some sort of state space where we can then define a model that separates them into their various classes. And depending on how this model does, uh, we can essentially train it to learn from the errors it makes uh, in order to make adjustments until it's able to make relatively uh, intelligent classifications. So quick note, uh, the future examples I'm going to go over in this talk are specifically looking at supervised learning for images. And this is because I think it's a very illustrative task, but these same principles apply to other types of data, such as natural language and code, as well as other learning method, uh, methods, such as unsupervised or reinforcement learning. So there are five main elements of the learning process that are important to take note of. The input, like an image in this case, the output, which would be the classification in our case, the data, the entire data set that you're using, which might be images of birds and bears, the target function, and then the hypothesis of the target function that the machine makes. So there are a range of different kind of techniques that are used for what I will call canonical machine learning to pick out the features of the data that are going to be the most important for that particular task. So in images, maybe we want to examine certain colors or edges of images or you know, certain key points in the image. Uh, for text, maybe we want to look at how different uh, you know, words co-occur with one another across different word boundaries in order to do some sort of classification. And then for source code, maybe we want to look at program dependency graphs in order to learn meaningful representations to automate software engineering tasks. So what we hope with this canonical machine learning uh, you know, process is that engineers are able to essentially pick out and derive the most effective features for a particular task. And that this is going to then give us uh, basically enough information or give the learning algorithm enough information to infer the different, uh, the kind of function that will serve as the boundary for classifying different images in our image classification problem. So on the large scale ImageNet data set, this canonical type of machine learning uh, really is able to achieve about 60% accuracy. And a lot of the reason uh, for this relatively low accuracy is due to the need to either handcraft or kind of automate this feature engineering process. It's very, very difficult to learn this uh, you know, rich set of features that can describe the images to the point where we're able to then derive a function that can distinguish between them. 
And this leads us to talk about some of the shortcomings of traditional machine learning techniques, such as you know, manually deriving features is a very expensive and complicated task. Uh, oftentimes the uh, kernels or the functions that are needed to be learned over this data are really complex uh, to the point where it's very computationally expensive. And finally, we have a shallow representation of these features. They may not be capturing the hierarchical depth that's necessary uh, in order to make you know, a good distinction between classes of images in our example. This brings us to the advent of deep learning. So with deep learning, uh, we kind of transition away from this uh, handcrafted or you know, semi-automated uh, feature engineering feature uh, feature engineering that is associated with canonical machine learning. Instead, we are going to be looking at, you know, trying to automatically learn rich hierarchical feature embeddings via neural networks. So as I showed you before, uh, just like we have canonical representations across many different types of machine learning, we also have deep representations, things like neural networks, autoencoders, deep belief networks, deep Q learning, and autoencoders. These are essentially the deep counterparts to the canonical representations that have been developed over decades. The building blocks of deep learning are the neurons that make up these neural networks. And essentially, these uh, artificial neurons take in many inputs, and they multiply each of these inputs by a unique weight. These inputs essentially represent signals coming from other neurons, and the weights represent the strength of that signal. And the purpose of this, these building blocks is to essentially model and try to represent biological computational processes, at least as uh, we understand them today. So after all of this data gets fed into a neuron, you can either influence this with a bias in order to achieve some desired uh, properties, or it gets passed through what's called an activation function. And this activation function essentially tells us, you know, okay, based on the input data, what type of signal should we send out of the neuron according to the properties of that data? And there's a range of different activation functions such as RALU, uh, things like binary step, sigmoid, 10H, uh, softmax. The machine learning community has investigated a wide range of these uh, to see different types uh, that have different properties that can work. So one of the key features, and perhaps the thing that has enabled neural networks to grow in popularity so much, is the automatically learned rich embedding space that these models can produce. So if we take a task like uh, handwritten digit recognition, we can see after this has been passed through a neural network, we can visualize the rich embedding space that these types of models are able to learn through their kind of hierarchical compositional uh, features that are inherently kind of associated with these neural networks. So this is kind of the key feature that is really enabling the explosion of research uh, along these different types of techniques. So we can see, you know, uh, the neural network is going to be basically trying to learn these hierarchical compositional representations before it gets passed into this rich visualized embedding space. So this automated feature discovery process can be applied to a range of different tasks, whether it's graphical data, for example, like a program data, whether it's uh, sequential data, uh, where, such as text, where you know, we can extract information based upon you know, the co-occurrence of different sequences, the long-term dependencies between different sequences, things like this. And then as we've been seeing, you know, there are certain types of architectures that work really well for image data. Uh, things like uh, convolutional neural networks that are able to essentially learn very effectively these compositional representations. So how do these models learn from these deep embeddings? Well, we can adjust those neuron weights according to the errors that a network makes on a given task. So for example, let's go back to our image classification problem. Let's say we have a toucan and we want to see if our network is going to classify this right. We have an untrained network. In this case, we pass it through the network and the prediction is bare, and we know this is wrong. And because we know this is wrong with our labeled data, we can propagate an adjustment of the weights back through the network, in essence, allowing the network to learn over time. And by passing the network millions of examples of images, 
we're able to have uh, learn a very effective representation of these different weights. So there's different techniques by which these weights can be updated as well. The probably most popular algorithm is gradient descent, which can be done in either batch or stochastic variants, where essentially you are trying to adjust the weights until you get to some sort of optimal minimum or optimal place in uh, the kind of representation of the network where you're able to best optimize your target function. So with this type of deep representation, uh, these deep learning techniques have managed to surpass human levels of accuracy on the ImageNet classification data set, which is really, really uh, astounding, to be honest. And this kind of helps to illustrate why there would be such an interest in actually taking these techniques and applying them to software engineering data. But there are some definitely uh, some definite advantages and drawbacks to these deep learning techniques. And we've discussed a lot of these advantages already. They don't really require manual feature engineering. They're capable of learning these rich hierarchical representations of data and they can be trained for a given task in an end-to-end -end fashion, such that there's a lot of automation involved. But there are trade-offs that are related to these advantages. They require massive data sets to function effectively. They are computationally very expensive to train, although this is improving. And probably most problematically, the models can be very difficult to interpret. That is, they are often function like a black box, and it's difficult to understand why a given prediction is being made. So this brings us to the next topic of this talk, which is the current state of research in this field called deep learning for software engineering. So you might ask, you know, why is there this kind of research push to apply these deep learning techniques to various types of software engineering tasks uh, to automate them. And I think the answer is that as software engineering researchers, we are incredibly lucky to have a large sets of open, incredibly rich uh, data sources. So things like open source software repositories and GitHub and GitLab, uh, different types of data that's available in SourceForge, Bitbucket or Google Play, uh, these are all really, really rich sources of information that include many different types of artifacts from which we can learn patterns and apply deep learning techniques to. And by applying these deep learning techniques and learning these patterns, we're able to then generate and make predictions that can allow for the creation of automated tools. So a natural question is, you know, what is the current state of the art in deep learning for software engineering currently? So to answer this question, uh, me and some of my colleagues have conducted a systematic literature review on the use of deep learning in software engineering research. And I'm really excited about the way that we formulated this particular uh, paper. That is because we centered the research questions upon the traditional components of learning that I introduced earlier. So that is the unknown target function, the training examples, the learning model, and the final hypothesis. So in essence, what we have looked at is we've tried to see, okay, what is the SE task, the software engineering task that's being targeted, what data is being used, what different types of learning models are being used, and how well do these approaches function in practice? How well is their final hypothesis approximated? And then finally, we also looked at issues related to the reproducibility and replicability of this work, given how complex and how many moving parts are associated with these various models. So this systematic literature review spans the time period from 2009 to about uh, mid-2019 and covers a range of different venues across software engineering, programming languages, and artificial intelligence. We wanted to capture as broad a research vision as possible. And then finally, we followed this popular methodology from uh, Kitchenham et al. So this is an outline of our search process. So we applied our search strings to these different databases that include these publications. We ended up with about 1,700 papers. And then after a lot of filtering and essentially sampling to make sure that we are getting a representative number of papers, we ended up with 109 papers by which we are uh, going to actually examine in this particular literature review. Now, if we look at the distribution of publication across these venues, what we see is actually somewhat interesting, and that is 
there's a relatively broad representation across the conferences and journals associated with these various research fields, software engineering, programming languages, and artificial intelligence. This signals to us that there is definitely some intersectionality in terms of the interest of researchers on this particular topic of deep learning for software engineering. But let's jump into answering the research questions. So first, we wanted to examine what is the target function that's being approximated? In other words, what is the SE task that these approaches are focusing on? So researchers have applied deep learning techniques to a diverse set of tasks, wherein program synthesis, code comprehension, and source code generation are the most prevalent. We found that the SE task targeted by a given study is typically a strong indicator of other details regarding these other components of learning that I'm going to talk about throughout this survey. While there has been a recent wealth of work on deep learning for software engineering, there are still underrepresented topics that should be considered by the research community. In particular, we want to highlight different topics in software testing and program analysis. Next, we examined the different types of data that are being used across these different techniques. And what we found was that, not surprisingly, overwhelmingly source code and oftentimes corresponding natural language descriptions of source code are by far the two most prevalent types of data that are being used. So our analysis found that while there are, have been a variety of different uh, types of SE data used, there were you know, these were by far the two most prevalent. And we identified, you know, software requirements, dependencies, and software licenses as some of the kind of underutilized or underanalyzed topics according to this analysis. But I think that there is a lot of opportunity here for future research across different data sets specifically tailored for a software engineering tasks. And I'll talk about this a little bit more at the end of the presentation. Next, we wanted to look at how was this data processed to be fed into these deep learning models. And what we found was, again, kind of two overwhelming techniques that really make sense given what we found with the uh, types of data that we were looking at. So we found that traditional tokenization or embeddings were the most popular, uh, where you know this makes sense for sequential information. This is how a lot of you know, NLP techniques will uh, essentially process data. And we also found uh, different types of neural embeddings that were used. So these are essentially uh, different types of techniques where you're going to apply a like a word to vec model or a shallow neural network in order to produce uh, rich embeddings in that way. Next, we looked at the learning model. And this is both the learning algorithm and the hypothesis set. So we found a range of different neural network architectures that have been used across uh, software engineering research. This is everything from an encoder decoder models to convolutional neural networks, autoencoders, CNNs, recurrent neural networks, and even tailored approaches uh, you know, such as graph neural networks for specific types of SE tasks. However, what we found in terms of popularity was that overwhelmingly recurrent neural networks and encoder decoder models were the most popular overall. And uh, you know, as you can see across the different types of tasks here, this again kind of makes sense based on the types of data that we were seeing used. We're seeing a lot of textual data, which can be modeled sequentially by RNNs and encoder decoder networks. So it follows that these were some of the most popular types of networks that we saw. So we also found that you know there is opportunities here to specifically grow and tailor some of these approaches to software engineering tasks. Uh, so for example, trying to look at how we might be able to contextualize some of these off-the-shelf models that have been developed in the machine learning community to specific software engineering tasks. Additionally, our analysis also revealed four different techniques for updating the weights of deep learning models, with the large majority making use of gradient descent. We found four major techniques that were utilized for calculating error, uh, including cross entropy, which was by far the most popular, negative log likelihood, and maximum log likelihood. And we observed a number of different optimization algorithms, with four being the most popular. Um, Atom was overwhelmingly the most popular. We also observed RMS prop, Ada Delta, and Ada Grad. Now, one important aspect of training any machine learning model 
is looking to combat the problem of overfitting. And this problem of overfitting essentially describes when you train a model on a particular data set and it works really well on that data set, but doesn't tend to generalize beyond that data set uh, much more broadly. So this, in this uh, research question, we tried to look at the different techniques that were used to try to mitigate this problem of overfitting these techniques. By far, we found the most uh, popular technique was having some sort of dropout uh, exist within the neural network architectures themselves. But we also found a lot of authors you know, working towards using data cleaning, uh, regularization, and early stopping techniques. However, somewhat alarmingly, nearly a quarter of the papers we surveyed didn't discuss any such uh, techniques to combat overfitting. And we want to bring this to the research community's attention and you know, try to really emphasize that these different parts of this uh, deep learning process uh, should be you know, considered and documented within the research papers themselves. For research question four, we looked at the final hypothesis. That is, how well did these models approximate the function they were trying to approximate and what were the results? The first aspect of this that we looked at was the different benchmarks that were used by the community. So this graph shows some of the different types of benchmarks that were used across the different SE tasks that we observed. And you know, somewhat encouragingly, we do see that there are a lot of available benchmarks. However, we also observe that there are a lot of self-generated benchmarks or benchmarks that are not available to the broader community. And this can be a real problem, particularly given the complexity in replicating and reproducing some of these deep learning studies. So I'll talk a little bit about this in the, more in the last half of the presentation, but this is also something that's worth noting. We also looked at the claimed impact that these different papers were making. In particular, we looked at the claims that the authors made and tried to categorize them into different groups. And what we found was that by far the most popular type of claim made was some sort of increased automation or efficiency related to these different techniques. Uh, we also saw some papers that claim some sort of new advanced architecture or novelty related to the technique itself, or increased performance over some predecessor that had been applied to the same type of software engineering task. Finally, we also looked at a consideration of something called Occam's razor. So Occam's razor basically states that when you are trying to solve a problem, oftentimes the simplest technique should be the one that you try first and you know, to see if that works the best. And there has been some recognition in the community that you know, there has been a kind of tendency to just apply deep learning techniques to a wide variety of software engineering tasks without first considering whether a simple technique would do as well as those deep learning tasks. And a very good case study on this is this paper by Fu and Menzies, uh, where they look at, uh, you know, essentially looking at how certain SE tasks can really work just, you know, the automation can work just fine with more canonical machine learning techniques as opposed to introducing all the complexity that comes with deep learning techniques. So I encourage you to check out this paper if you're interested on in more about this topic. So we essentially broke down uh, uh, authors' uh, handling of Occam's razors according to two categories. That is, they either varied the model uh, to look at, you know, the uh, basically performing an ablation study to see how well a simpler form of their model might work, or looking at a baseline comparison, hopefully to a either a less complex neural network or a more canonical machine learning technique. Or they did both of these, and as you can see, a, a majority of the papers had some sort of consideration of Occam's razor, which was encouraging to us. But there is still a kind of somewhat unacceptably high portion of papers that do not discuss this. So we want to emphasize that, you know, this is something that the community really should try to focus on, uh, you know, to try to show that, look, this complexity with these types of deep learning models is not only a good fit for this problem, but it, you know, hands down outperforms you know, some of these more uh, traditional canonical machine learning techniques that could also be applied. Finally, we looked at reproducibility and replicability, or factors that affect this. And here what we found wasn't quite as encouraging. 
So our analysis illustrates that only about 15 of our primary studies could conceivably be labeled as replicable. Whereas about half of our studies, around 56, could be reasonably reproduced based on the description given in the study. So a lot of this was due to either there not being an existing repository of the code or data that was used in the paper, or certain types of missing details that weren't present in the paper, the most common of which being things related to uh, filtering details, uh, the hyperparameters that were used, uh, or even the learning algorithm that was used for a particular project. So while this was you know, somewhat discouraging to us, we wanted to try to, in essence, try to take what we have seen from the study and produce a set of guidelines that were that could be used in order to hopefully guide researchers towards applying these deep learning techniques in a way that's going to facilitate reporting all of these necessary components of learning, such that the work is going to be reproduci reproducible based on the description of the paper, and also encouraging authors to share their code and data when it's uh, possible in order to facilitate these practices of open science. Okay, so that is the current state of research in deep learning for software engineering. In the last part, and probably the most exciting part of this talk, I want to look ahead and look at the future directions and paths forward for this particular research topic. Now to do this, I'm going to be drawing knowledge from both the literature review that I just ran over, as well as a report resulting from the NSF workshop on deep learning and software engineering, which took place on San Diego uh, in 2019 at the ASE conference. And in particular, I'm going to be looking at two major topics here related to future work. One, we've discussed a lot already, that is deep learning for software engineering, leveraging these deep learning techniques in order to automate or improve existing software engineering tasks. But there's a flip side to this, and that is software engineering for deep learning, where deep learning techniques are viewed as a new form of software development that needs tool and process support. So I'm going to focus most of my discussion on DL for SE, and I'm going to briefly touch upon some of the challenges that are starting to emerge as part of software engineering for deep learning. So let's look at DL for SE first. There are a number of important future research directions that have been identified uh, by the community in this space. First, that there has been decades of really, really impressive empirical work done in software engineering research. That is, you know, people have conducted studies, tried to build knowledge about different processes, tools, and techniques that software engineers use. And I think that there's a great opportunity to combine this existing body of empirical knowledge with features learned via deep learning. Next, I think there's also a great opportunity to combine different types of heterogeneous sources of software engineering data. Everything from source code to natural language descriptions to visual data to execution data that can be uh, you know, taken from programs. There's a really large opportunity to not only kind of learn joint embeddings or you know, learn compositional representations of different types of multimodal data, um, but you know, this can really drive forward certain advancements in you know, SE tasks where one data source might not be enough to make the types of predictions that are needed. Next, uh, I think that there's also an opportunity for developing architectures that are specifically tailored for software engineering data. And that is, you know, a lot of the soft, uh, DL for SE work tends to kind of take some of these models that exist, uh, you know, from the machine learning research community and try to fit them into problems in our domain. But I think there's a ample opportunity here to tailor and customize those approaches uh, even even more to the particular types of SE data and SE tasks that software engineering researchers are generally working with. As I've alluded to already, there's also a need for a you know community guidelines supporting systematic and reproducible research methodology uh, related to work in the deal for SE space. And then finally, I think as we're starting to see some of these tools, you know, migrate and, uh, you know, be released publicly, we need to start to think about some of the ethical and social considerations of deep learning for software engineering. And I'll touch on this a little bit more in just a minute. 
So continuing to look at some of these future directions, similar to uh, there being you know certain types of you know models that may be uh, needed to be tailored for you know these deep learning techniques, I think there's also a large opportunity to design new effectiveness metrics for software engineering specific tasks. You know, is you know blue score going to be the you know the best um, way that we can measure the output of a code generation approach? I would probably argue probably not. So I think there's a lot of uh, opportunity here for looking at how we can tightly couple these metrics to the types of SE data and tasks that we're used to work. Another area that I think is also going to be very important as these techniques start to become more practical and start to be introduced to developer is looking at some of the HCI aspects of these AI assisted developer tools. So looking at things like, you know, what should the user interface encompass, you know, for a code suggestion tool? You know, what, uh, you know, how are programmers going to interact with them? Are there certain tasks that maybe don't require or shouldn't have, you know, AI assistance? So I think there's a lot of questions here and we started to see some work coming out about this. Next, I think there's, as I've kind of alluded to already, a, you know, a real opportunity to kind of develop tailored, clean kind of community data sets that are tightly coupled to specific SE tasks. Now, as I said earlier, as software engineering researchers, we are kind of blessed or maybe cursed with this large amount of data that exists in these open source repositories. And you know, we need to not we need to be able to mine the data from these repositories, clean it, process it, and really make them actionable for different types of tasks. I think we tend to see the most uh, you know rapid research progress on a particular SE task when there's a really robust data set supporting that particular task. So I would encourage the community to continue to push forward in this direction. There are also tons of new application areas and data sources that I think uh, you know, could be useful for some of these different uh, you know, uh, DL for SE uh, you know, applications, whether it's things like uh, bug reporting or new brand new sources of data we haven't even thought about yet. But I'm going to touch on these a little bit more in just a minute. So I want to highlight a couple of these areas that I see as being particularly important moving forward, starting with some of the ethical and social considerations of DL for SE. So this is a bug report against the GitHub Copilot tool where a developer was worried that uh, the the tool itself was actually emitting, uh, you know, secrets that can be, you know, personally identifiable and could, you know, potentially cause some security issues uh, when trying to, you know, autocomplete some code uh, here, kind of trying to have the model autocomplete the API key. Now, luckily, this was kind of shown to be a non-issue uh, to a certain extent because GitHub has taken some precautions against these specific sort of things. So. Again, I highlight this not because it's a current problem with Copilot, but because it illustrates some of the types of considerations that we will need to be thinking about as we're training these large scale models on what is essentially you know, publicly available data. I think there's a lot of work that needs to be done here that tries to examine, okay, what are the things that we can do to you know, essentially try to have this uh, you know, workflow, uh, you know, think about some of the things, some of the negative consequences and avoid those consequences before these tools are released out. Into Another one uh, that I'd like to highlight is the HCI aspects of these tools. And we started to see some studies come out related to, you know, how code completion is going to, you know, affect developers in the wild. And I would love to see more types of studies like these uh, undertaken by the community. You know, I think there's a, you know, a real promise here to try to you know look at where we can best fit in some of these different tools into developers workflows it doesn't really matter if you have a model that's going to be 95 percent accurate if it's presented to the developer in a way that's going to you know be in friction with their typical workflows so these types of studies i think are going to become increasingly important in the future Next is kind of new application areas and data sources. I think there are tons of new potential SE tasks ranging from code review, software testing, troubleshooting tasks like bug reporting, 
bug triaging, requirements engineering, there's a lot of ground to break in DL for SE research. There's also potential new data sets uh, that could be tailored for specific SE tasks, you know, looking at graphical software artifacts, potentially instrumenting IDEs to get, you know, fine-grained developer information, and also looking at some exploratory data analysis for existing data sets to better understand what comprises them and, you know, what, if any, steps we need to uh, take in order to reduce or mitigate things like bias and data snooping in these data sets. There's been some great work that looks at, you know, deduplication of code and the effects of duplicated code on DL for SE tasks. So I think all of these are really important directions forward. And finally, I'd like to highlight, uh, last but not least, really trying to emphasize combining the empirical body of knowledge that's been generated by decades of research and using this to inform the design and application of deep learning. So that concludes my discussion of future work on DL for SE. And next, I want to very briefly talk about SE for DL. Starting with a somewhat provocative quote uh, that Andre Karpathy, the director of AI at Tesla, has made. Essentially, he said, I'm sorry, gradient descent can write code better than you. And you know, while this might have been a bit of a snarky comment, really what he's referring to is that neural networks are not just another classifier. They represent the beginning of a fundamental shift in how we write software that he terms software 2.0. So as I highlighted earlier, this kind of machine learning and deep learning paradigm really kind of flips the script with traditional programming. With traditional programming, you have a program that you specify analytically in a set of kind of atomic instructions that operates on some data and produces some output. But in situations where it's really hard to actually analytically pin down a program to accomplish a given task, this type of deep learning or machine learning techniques that take the data and the expected output and essentially search for or infer this program are, can be really, really effective. So we are shifting from this kind of atomic, uh, you know, analytical way of specifying code to these deep learning based systems that instead are trying to automatically learn these things from large depots of data. So how is deep learning software 2.0? Well, essentially here, rather than basically specifying a single program that we, you know, work on, debug, you know, test, that kind of, you can think of existing in this kind of search space of the correct program, what Software 2.0 does is it essentially tries to optimize uh, this uh, search space until we arrive at the optimal program for that particular problem using this process of optimization, gradient descent, you know, whatever type of uh, learning model you're using. And this dramatically shifts the, uh, essentially the, the types of issues that we might be dealing with. Uh, so, you know, whereas in, you know, regular software development, you're dealing with things uh, like, you know, debugging your code and, uh, you know, trying to look at how it's interacting with data. Here we have things like, you know, collecting data, verifying it, extracting features, and that analyzing the data, monitoring it when it's deployed. And we can see that there's really a shift versus this kind of traditional software engineering process to this new kind of ML, deep learning assisted software engineering process. So will deep learning encompass all software? Well, I would wager probably not. But it's very clear that the applications of deep learning are numerous and growing. Everything from image recognition to understanding, uh, to speech synthesis through neural networks, uh, to machine translation. Uh, it's basically been very clear that there are some really uh, important aspects of this that really these do better, uh, you know, deep learning does better at these tasks than humans could ever hope to write a program for analytically. So this really shifts this traditional software development lifecycle on its head, whereas instead of you know, going through the typical requirements, design, development, testing, deployment, we have you know, a new form of requirements engineering, a data collection process, a data cleaning or pro, you know, preparation process, a model learning process, uh, as well as a kind of deployment and management. So this brings with it a whole new set of development, maintenance, testing, and debugging challenges. So I'd like to briefly talk about a few of these. You know, when we are talking about, you know, software development for deep learning, 
deriving requirements here can actually be really hard to you know specify exactly what the appropriate requirements for a model are. Uh, estimating the effort for how long it's going to take to you know get the data, train the model, you know test that in some way is very difficult. Managing you know a wide range of different experiments and you know labeling data and versioning all these models are brand new challenges that uh, the research community really needs to start, I think, to, to look at and examine to see if there's anything we can offer to facilitate this process. There are also a number of maintenance challenges in SC4DL, things like uh, new forms of technical debt, uh, dependencies that exist in data sets rather than just in code, uh, the kind of uh, reliance on pre-trained models in certain domains, uh, experimental code paths, managing the configuration of these models, uh, to just evolving hardware and software. There's so many moving parts related to maintenance for deep learning systems, uh, you know, that it can be really difficult. You know, a lot of the technical debt here, you know, a lot of what's going on is basically gluing these model components together and trying to have this interact with more canonical, traditional, analytical software. So there's a lot here that researchers need to examine. There's also testing challenges related to testing data rather than the code itself, deployment testing, uh, discovery of edge cases, uh, non-determinism in the models, as well as uh, performance testing. So, you know, in a typical, uh, you know, kind of straightforward, uh, you know, testing, you know, procedure, we debug code, you know, we test the code itself. But, you know, model code is very different than your traditional analytical software. And, you know, really you need to be testing a combination of the data, the model, and the model code itself. And, you know, there's, we need to test not only the models, but also these production ready systems. So this entire end to end process. There are also many challenges related to debugging from, you know, requiring a trained model to debug to, you know, not having traditional debuggers as we know them not really apply. Uh, to the lazy execution of models, potential bugs in the data sets themselves, um, the bugs that can be very abstract given the hard to interpret nature of these models, as well as bugs in the models themselves. So we need to kind of shift our thinking of you know, the traditional step through debugger that we're used to in software 1.0 and think about how we can design these techniques for software 2.0. Finally, there's a number of challenges in deployments Things like feedback loops if the model is self-learning, uh, stream processing, distributed deep learning systems, uh, different modalities of data and handling the formatting and storage of these. Uh, these are all challenges that are going to need to be tackled by the community. So what are the next steps? Well, there's still a lot of work to be done in this space. And I think there is an outstanding opportunity for synergy between software engineering research and machine learning and deep learning research. There's a number of cross-cutting opportunities as well, things ranging from model interpretability to educational uh, materials for students that these communities can really work together to try to you know, uh, accomplish some of these, uh, tackle some of these challenges and these problems and these suggested future directions of research. I'd like to very briefly thank some of the uh, authors, Cody, Nathan, David, and Dennis of the DL4SC survey, as well as all of the different steering committee members and participants in the DLSC workshop that we conducted in 2019. I was instrumental in, you know, basically deriving a lot of the content for this presentation. So thank you very much again. My name is Kevin Moran. I'm an assistant professor at George Mason University. You can find all of the information, uh, the slides, the papers that I referred to on a video of the recording uh, at the link there, or you can use the QR code. Thank you very much. All right, so we got a number of really interesting questions uh, you know, related to this talk that I'd like to try to answer some of the most relevant ones now. So the first question is related to you know, why uh, there are, you know, why is there such prevalent kind of jargon, things like RELU, for seemingly simple ideas, uh, you know, related to deep learning, uh, you know, uh, projects and, and problems. And I think part of this is just that, you know, that's part of the nomenclature that has, you know, arisen out of the machine learning community. And I think if as software engineering researchers, if we want to, you know, try to 
better understand and apply the different types of uh, you know networks and techniques that have been used in that community, I think we need to collaborate more with those types of you know machine learning uh, researchers. The next question states that the people who are developing deep learning tools, techniques, and algorithms are mostly software engineers. Yet they tend to forget you know some of the established set of software engineering best practices. And this leads to many problems that, you know, we're now facing, such as black boxes, ethical issues, etc. So, you know, what are some of the things we can do to work to mitigate this? And, you know, I think part of this is, uh, you know, related to some of the different uh, directions for future research that I was talking about during the presentation. Things like, you know, trying to draw upon the existing knowledge of empirical work that exists out there to inform our creation, you know, of these deep learning tools. And also starting to more seriously examine some of the social and ethical considerations related to some of the deep learning projects and techniques that are being applied to automate software engineering tasks. So you talked about things. Uh, anal you talked about analyzing things other than code. Should log files and bug reports be high on that list? So I'm a bit biased uh, towards bug reports because I'm very interested in bug reporting research. Um, but I think yeah, those are two that you know I think could yield some very interesting results uh, if you started to you know perform some type of deep learning analysis on them. But I will say at a broader level, I think there's a range of different data sources that could be really interesting to model you know, for uh, deep learning techniques. Uh, everything from that I talked about before, you know, things like uh, code review, you know, other types of artifacts, design documents, uh, requirements, there's a lot of, uh, you know, potential research directions there. What is the state of applying deep learning to software performance, especially for software that is, uh, you know, deployed uh, as a cloud-based service? So this was actually one of the areas that we identified in our uh, systematic literature review that we felt could be pushed forward further by the community. There's still not quite that much, uh, you know, work out there that's examining this particular problem. So I think, you know, particularly as people are, you know, working to optimize their applications when they're deployed to the cloud, that this could be something that's, you know, really important uh, for researchers to look at. Uh, so another question asks, is there a focus for DL for SE tasks for low coding? Uh, this is a good question. I think, you know, we started to see kind of the advent of more low code and no code techniques. Um, and I have seen some work and I've actually done a little bit of work on my, uh, myself that tries to maybe abstract some of the more complex uh, software engineering processes. Uh, such as building a graphical user interface uh, to work towards being low code or no code. So I think there is, uh, you know, some push in the community to explore this direction of work, primarily as it relates to things like graphical user interfaces. Um, so I would encourage you to check out some of that work. Some has been published at things like uh, ICSI, Transactions on Software Engineering, as well as at some of the HCI venues like Kai. So I think uh, you know there's uh, some opportunity for pushing that direction of work even further past you know things that are just related to the graphical user interface. It seems that some of the challenges in future directions apply to mining software engineering data in general. Would you estimate that the state of affairs in deep learning to be more severe, less severe, or uh, comparable to the state of affairs in general? So. I think that there are some specific problems that exacerbate, uh, you know, the current state of affairs, particularly for uh, DL for SE research, and that is that because of the complexity uh, of the various moving parts, the various different components of these models, that it can be a little bit more dire, you know, if people are not properly describing things you know, very, very rigorously describing the various components of learning, uh, releasing code and data to the best of their ability to facilitate kind of open science practices, uh, that this can be a little bit more, you know, dire than, you know, just traditionally looking at the field of mining software repositories more broadly. Um, so we do encourage people to kind of, you know, look at some of the guidelines that we've produced, uh, you know, look at how you're describing various aspects of your learning techniques in your papers and try to make sure that you are doing everything you can to make sure that they are, you know, repl replicable and uh, reproducible. Okay. 
So there's kind of a statement here that I'd like to comment on where someone says, uh, deep learning is yet another tool to help software engineers in better coding and testing, um, but they would not replace a human being in designing a program. And I actually wholeheartedly agree with this statement. I think that a lot of the uh, techniques that software engineering researchers are working on should be geared towards augmenting uh, software engineers and humans and not replacing them. I think that you know, at least with the current types of techniques that we have uh, at our disposal in terms of, you know, machine learning and deep learning more broadly, it's going to be very difficult to outright replace engineers in a lot of the tasks that are done. But by taking the stance of trying to, you know, build these techniques in synergy with these engineers, with these developers, I think we can, you know, not only facilitate building higher quality software, but I think this is, you know, a really just a a need at this point, given how intertwined software has become in society more broadly. Do you think deep learning techniques can be applied to software engineering education and training research? Uh, I think that it is important to teach aspects of deep learning, uh, as well as kind of this new data science or machine learning pipelines that are starting to find their way more and more into, you know, traditional software projects, uh, particularly, you know, as this kind of software 2.0 continues to evolve and get used in an in industry. So I think the probably the that's where I would see the greatest educational needs being is, you know, kind of trying to explain to students that, look, we have these two ways of developing software, and they really are starting to, you know, intertwine with one another. And it's important to understand limitations and the proper modes of application for one versus the other. We have so many great questions here. I don't have time to answer all of them. We have uh, almost uh, almost 50 questions here, but I'm trying to pick out the ones that I hope will have the, the highest impact. Uh, so deep learning is not an explainable AI tool. Do you think that explainability is important in deep learning for software engineering? And my answer to this is absolutely particularly as we try to move these techniques towards you know being deployed in practice becoming really practical tools i think that you know engineers or developers are going to require that there's some semblance of uh you know indication of why these models are making certain predictions or making certain decisions in order to you know boost their confidence in actually using these in their day-to-day -day workflows so I think it's absolutely critical that we start to, you know, explore work on explainable AI, particularly for software engineering problems. And I've started to see some of this come out, uh, I think related to automated defect prediction, for example, where people are trying to explain some of the decisions that these seemingly black box models are making. So this is absolutely an important. I think the last question that I will answer is, so there's software that allows users to code, uh, you know, using a graphical user interface like Excel. If software 2.0 figures out these programs, could this enable new user-focused environments which allow users to enhance and modify software for them? So I think this is going back to the question on kind of low-code, no-code environments a bit. And my answer would be absolutely. I think there's an opportunity for this. I think that, you know, as software becomes more tightly integrated into various aspects of society, it's going to be important for, you know, people without the necessarily all of the technical depth and background that's required to be an engineer to be able to, you know, reason with, modify, you know, different types of programs or, you know, even program might not be the right word, different types of automation uh, that they, you know, use either in their work or their personal lives. So I think that software 2.0 does present an opportunity for this. So thank you everyone for the amazing questions that you've uh, asked. I hope that you found this talk informative. Uh, like I said, all the information uh, for this talk will be available on my website at the link there. Uh, thank you for attending and uh, I look forward to seeing the what the next decade of uh, research at the intersection of deep learning and software engineering holds.